The movie begins in Texas, where the 24th Infantry under the command of Sergeant Hayes is situated overseeing the building of Camp Logan, where they will be trained. Colonel Charles Norton says that they will carry to the shores of France if they prove their worth and will soon make a legacy. Later that day, the men dig holes as they talk about flying to France. Suddenly, Walker questions Boston's reason for staying in the 24th Infantry if he had already been to France and is well-versed. He then answers that he wants to serve his country and raise the image of men of color. On the other hand, Walker is unconvinced of his vision and puts out his razor, alerting and intimidating the men. He states he is just messing with Boston as he wants to be familiar with him. Then, the commotion intensifies, but Hayes immediately stops them. Later, Boston talks about his experience in France to Joe. While walking, they see Lucky eating by an unfinished house when suddenly, a white carpenter pees on him. Angered by the action, Boston quickly helps him get away from the white guys, to which Lucky shows disgust and frustration. In the evening, the two, along with Franklin, walk the empty streets of Houston, Texas, as they are going back to camp. As they reach the train station, they pay their fare of three cents. The train separates white people from colored men, who are only allowed to sit in the back part of the vehicle. Walker then enters the train to sit in the white people's area. His action makes the pilot criticize his seat and firmly commands him to go to the back. His comrades call for him as they know that it can raise a commotion. Still, Walker refuses, stating that the back is full and he is a soldier headed back to camp. After that, the pilot calls for help from Officer Cross, who is just passing by. The colored soldiers are now getting more nervous, and they try to make him join them at the back. Cross enters the train and orders all the civilians to get off the train. He punches Walker, who justifies that he is a soldier and can sit wherever he wants. He tries to fight back, but the other white officer stops him. Seeing this, his comrades try to intervene but are intimidated by the white military police. The following day, Colonel Charles compliments Private Boston because of his credentials and is allowed to be recommended to a colored officer training school in Iowa. Quickly, he refuses and says that he wants to be of service to people and his race. Charles accepts his decision and moves on to another issue, which he brought up last night's event, and asks why Walker violated the racial code. In defense, he answers that he is a soldier in the U.S. Army and it was them who violated his American rights. On the contrary, Major Abner Lockhart disagrees and says that black men do not have rights in Houston, Texas. The colonel also tells him that he expects them to obey the racial code and dismisses him. That night, Boston attends an event in town where he meets a woman for the first time. The beautiful woman plays the piano with different musical pieces by well-known pianists as he approaches her. Then, a group of men goes to the stage to play for the event, and she says she is there solely to distract. He asks her to dance with him, which she accepts. The people of color enjoy themselves as they dance the night away. After some time, she says she has to go home, so he offers to walk her home, where they talk until they reach her place. Before bidding goodbye, Boston asks for her name. He learns that the beautiful woman is Marie Downing and introduces himself. The next day, Chief of Police Carter Hammond assures Colonel Charles that there will be no further problems with the Houston police. In exchange, as the military police of the Houston, they must ensure the order of the 24th men only, and any trouble encountered must be reported to the new corporal, Boston. His comrades show their happiness for his promotion, unfortunately, First Sergeant Hayes enters the office and mocks him. Then, Boston protests the colonel that they need more than nightsticks when patrolling the town. However, he says that he cannot provide his request, and anything that happens to them will be reported to the war departments. Once again, he requests that they be treated as soldiers and men. Later that evening, Boston visits Marie to bring her flowers. He says he cannot stop thinking about her and asks if he can come in, but she refuses because she has Walker as her guest. He asks if they are in a relationship, but even before she answers, Walker closes the door. The next day, in the queue for food, Walker walks up to him and insults him about the last night of visiting Marie. He even calls Marie his whore, which makes Boston mad. He punches Walker, and the two immediately put themselves into a fistfight as the other soldiers cheer. Then, Hayes stops by shouting, and Lockhart mediates and drags them for punishment. As their punishment, their hands are tied up while they are naked. Lockhart gathers a sack of grapefruit and goes toward Boston. He hits him with the bag of grapefruit while he struggles because of the pain. The next day, Boston is lectured by the colonel because of the fistfight, and he immediately dismisses him. 
As he goes out, Lockhart says they are inferior and that Boston is no different. The colonel questions if his educational background makes him think he is inferior. He stands up and asks if he's dismissed but is answered by an unyielding no. He states that he can have him court-martialed or stripped of his rank because of what he did. That same day, Joe and Boston talk as they stroll in the camp when suddenly, someone reports to them that a colored man is in trouble. They enter the vehicle and go to the place of the clamor. They come across a dead colored man lying on the ground with Walker holding him. Boston commands the white guy named Tommy Lee to drop his knife, but the man only spits on the ground. He looks back and sees Joe leaving the area, he calls for him, but he keeps walking away. Once again, he orders the white man to drop his knife, but he threatens to attack him, so he immediately grabs his hand and takes him hostage. He tells the white men that they will not get paid if they are to attack the soldiers. He then asks Miller to carry the man and bring it with them. At the front of the chief's office, he takes the man saying that he arrested him for threatening the 24th Infantry and murder. The chief asks Tommy if it's true, and he says, that's right, unhesitatingly. The leader then tells the police to arrest Tommy. The white military police protest and are shocked by the command, but the chief intimidates him to be fired if he does not obey him. At the colonel's office, Boston frantically reported about the incident a while ago. He raises his voice, saying it was an encounter of 20 men outnumbering four. The major strongly reminds him to talk calmly with the colonel. Again, he requests side arms but refuses to give them as the chief will not allow them. Additionally, he says that the police want to kill him as they go out of his tent. As they go out, the colored soldiers outside cheer and clap for him because he is the first colored man to arrest a white man. That night, Walker walks to him and questions him for standing up to the white men that way earlier. They talk about their lives as black men and how they were orphaned and separated from their families at a young age. Then, Walker takes back what he said about Marie, says she is a proper lady and clears out that they are not together. The following day, Boston visits Marie to have a word with her. She asks if he is following her and that she doesn't like it, but he reassures her and asks her out on a lunch date. At the diner, he asks about the flowers he gave her and if she has thrown them away, which she didn't. After lunch, they spend more time in the park, where he swings her and talks about the army. He says that he joined the military to prove their rights. At one point, the topic goes about their fears. He says that if you die fighting for justice, you never really die. He then stops swinging her and attempts a kiss, where she first hesitates but gives in afterward. Later, Boston confronts Joe and asks why he ran off during their encounter with the white men. He answers by talking about his history and a telegram he received from home on the 4th of July. He adds that no one can find his sister and her baby, so he returns home to his mother's house, where he sees their house full of bullet holes. After the conversation, he offers him his mojo for protection. He admits that the white folks scare him to death, and he is hopeless about winning against them. The following day, Ben visits Colonel Charles to announce that their father died two days ago. Then, he proceeds with his offer for Charles to oversee the combat soldiers in the War Department in France. He is in awe of the great news as he says that the 24th Infantry is a crack unit that has drilled and trained men. His brother stops him midway, clarifying that the offer is only for him and he cannot bring his team to France. In lieu, Ben expresses his disappointment with Charles's decision to command colored men. In defense, he says that these men have the honor and that they deserve better treatment. After that, Major Abner Lockhart is now proclaimed by Charles as the new commanding officer of the 24th Infantry. He calls on 1st Sergeant Hayes to dismiss the battalion, which he obeys. As the men disperse, only Boston stays still on his ground, so Charles approaches him to ask about his concerns. He assures that Lockhart will serve and protect them as he has a stern agreement with him. However, Boston strongly believes that he doesn't understand and asks what they must do. Once again, Charles suggests leaving the infantry to attend the officer training school to make a difference. Disappointed, Boston reminds him of their consensus about the coloreds being treated as soldiers and as men. Subsequently, he vents to Marie about the happenings back at the camp. On the other hand, she talks about her history with her father, who had a storefront church in San Felipe where she plays piano every service. Then, she tells about his father's deacon Johnny Tibbs who asked him to be his girl one time they were alone. She says that she turned him down, but that did not stop him. Instead, he made his way to her, and she was still blamed regardless of being the victim. As she gets emotional, Boston hugs her as she cries in his arms and advises him to get out of the place, 
but he urges her to come with him. Because of this, Boston announces to Hayes that he reconsiders and wants to attend the officer training school. They have a commotion as Hayes accuses him of running away on his duty as a soldier. The next day, he approaches his comrades to say that he reconsiders and accepts the offer of going to school. They sing and cheer for him as they see the success of Boston as theirs, too, as colors. In the village of Houston, Texas, Mr. Cross shoots black people while riding his horse. A black woman, startled and intimidated, shouts at him, claiming that he almost shot her baby. He stops and goes down his horse, and proceeds to the woman. She says she didn't mean anything about it as Cross approaches the baby. Then, he returns to the woman, slaps her, and drags her out to board her on one of the horses. One of the colored men stands up and attacks Cross, he is caught up in a fistfight against two of them. The other civilians quickly find Boston, who is on his way to propose to Marie, and inform him about the dispute. She tries to stop him from going into the commotion, but he chooses to respond to his call of duty, so Marie can only watch as he leaves. Afterward, Boston confronts Cross about detaining one of his soldiers, but the white officers disagree and intimidate him even more. Cross hits Boston in the face, but he throws soil to blind his vision as he escapes. Unfortunately, the officers continue to follow him, riding their horses while he runs for his life. Eventually, a man reports to the camp and says that Boston and Davids are killed, with news that a mob is coming to finish them off. Immediately filled with great anger and misery, the men of the 24th Infantry prepare their weapons as they plan to avenge their comrades. As they gather in the armory, Lockhart enters and asks about the situation. Hayes fills him with answers and says that they are only defending themselves against the war that the Houston villagers declared a while ago. Still, Lockhart shouts at him to command his men to put down the guns and even threatens him to strip down his rank. He confiscates the armory key, and for the first time, Hayes looks back straight into his eyes which unnerves him. Lockhart picks Boston up in prison and learns that he is alive. He commands him to let Boston lie about the incident and calm his fellow soldiers. They then go back to camp and a debate bursts out between the soldiers and Lockhart regarding the mob coming to them. That same night, Lockhart was resting in his office when suddenly, gunshots rained. Joe shouts to alert the infantry that the militia of the white folks is coming. He points out to the darkness as Lockhart asks about the mob's position. Then, the other officers go to the armory to collect their weapons. On the 23rd of August 1917, in Houston, Texas, the colored soldiers marched with Sergeant Hayes in command. The platoon disperses and aims at every white military police they encounter. They feel no remorse as they murder every racist officer on their way, to the point where they even shoot civilians in the city due to their rage. On the other hand, Boston tries aiming at white folks but cannot pull the trigger despite wanting to. After a few moments, the soldiers block the driveway, where a car drives near, and Boston commands the unit to hold their fire. He checks on the passengers and confirms it is a family with a newborn baby, so he tells them to let the white family pass by. Later, another car drives, yelling and signaling for them to hold fire, but the platoon still shoots at them. Once again, Boston checks on the dead people, which leaves him speechless. Hayes goes near him and confirms they are National Guard soldiers, and so worry builds up in each man of the 24th Infantry. As their rebellion concludes, Hayes says they cannot return to camp and even commands Boston to kill him. He tells the other man to continue their march, shakes their hands, and lets Boston stays. He says he will not shoot him, so he instead gives him his pistol, which Hayes uses the gun to shoot himself in front of Boston. The men spend their days in the forest and watch as the morning comes. Later, the white police surround them and make them surrender their weapons. They march alongside each other with handcuffed hands, and the different colored men pay respect by taking off their hats. Then, Marie sees Boston and rushes toward him to protest but a white policeman shields himself with a rifle and pushes her with it. This angers Boston, but all the couple can do but accept their fate. On the 1st of November, 1917, three months after the incident, Colonel Charles met with Boston. He says that they will kill every last man if no one testifies for the prosecution. He negotiates that he has to testify against the infantry because he wants to save him. However, he stands firm, disagrees, and is unwilling to sacrifice the other soldiers. He talks about the discrimination they experienced from white people. Even though he did not shoot his gun, he wanted to kill them as much as the other soldiers did. Finally, he says that if death is the payment for a night of justice, he's ready to pay it. He answers, no, three more times. 
Then, Charles says he admires his service and his eagerness to sacrifice over his ambition. During the trial, Private Lucky gives his testimony against the men. It is confirmed that Private Davids is alive and was only beaten up badly by the officers. Then, he is asked about the leaders of the mutiny, and he answers and points to Private Walker, Franklin, Miller, Wilson, and Taylor. At that time, he says that the moment Joe yells was the signal for the false mutiny. He mentions that Walker told Jackson, Anderson, Lamont White, Anthony Harris, and Ennis Clark to go to town with Sergeant Clinton and Hayes leading the march. Lastly, he is questioned about the key figure of the mutiny, which he points out in Boston. He says that they all looked up to Boston, which influenced them to go and perform the mutiny. That being the case, the judge declares that they dishonored the country and asks them what they have to say for themselves. Boston rises and screams I am a man with his two clenched hands together. He announces adamantly the words, I am a man, and then the other men follow. As their voices go louder as they scream in unison, they overpower the judges and oppose being silenced. Following that, Charles reports the verdict grievously. He says that 58 out of 63 defendants are found guilty. 41 are sentenced to hard labor for the term of their natural lives. On the other hand, 13, as the ring leaders of the mutiny, were hung this morning at 5.30 a.m. One morning, Colonel Charles visits and gives Marie an envelope written by Boston. She looks at it and opens it. The letter conveys his feelings while he is in prison. He says he partook in the mutiny because he did it for her future children's husband so they would not suffer further. He says that they suffered already just for being black. Lastly, he wishes it did not have to end that way and bids goodbye by declaring his love for her. The movie ends with Marie sitting on a bus with colored and white folks, knowing that Boston and the other soldiers' sacrifices were not in vain. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications, and leave a like to help the channel out. Thank you for watching.